Hello and welcome to the bestseller experiment where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark Stay. And I'm Mark DeVoe. Before we get cracking with this uh, wonderful episode, we would like to thank all of you, everyone who's supporting this podcast, everyone out in podcast land that has been supporting us. If you have never heard about what this is, it's people that support us on uh, Patreon and what you get is early access to shows and loads of other goodies. We'd like to thank people like Heather Barnett, who signed up this week to support the podcast. So if you would like to join Heather and others, please pop along to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. Mr. Stay, it's been, it feels like it's just the other day that we did a podcast, but it wasn't. It was, uh, it was at least a couple of weeks ago and here we are again. How, how has it been for you? It's been great. It feels like something resembling normality is is because i've had my jab that's the first thing i've had my first uh astrazeneca jab uh i had a one day of grogginess it was really weird because i had my jab sort of six thirty in the evening final evening got up did my words first thing sort of closed the book logged my words on the 200 words a day and you know tweeted about it and then suddenly it was like someone just sat on my head and I was like, oh, so I, I did. I had 24 hours of feeling a bit groggy, but that that was fine. Had my hair cut, you know. Uh, so, you know, uh, and it, it, really, it really is. It really is. And uh, my hair hadn't been that long since 1987. And uh, <laughs> since that prog rock band you're in. <laughs> exactly. I, I did. I looked like a roadie for Genesis. It was really bad. And, um, I, I've actually been out to actual bookshops and seen my actual book in actual bookshops and signed actual copies. If you go to Waterstones in Canterbury, actually, I think they've sold a few already. Um, yeah, signed copies of The Crow Folk in bookshops. It's brilliant. It's been great. So it's... Uh, How weird. It's almost like delayed kind of release in some ways, isn't it? With 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 bookshops opening again. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's such a, such a wonderful thing. Oh, and the other thing that's happened is that film, What I Wrote, um, the the title change has been announced, so uh, I can I can reveal it here now if, if you're interested. Yeah, well, I'm really interested because <laughs> I I mean I know a lot of people originally. Now it was called The Little People originally, yes. wasn't it? Mm. Now what? How does a title change happen in a movie? I'm curious. Well, uh, we call it Little People because you know if you go to Ireland, the the, the story, listeners, if, is is about a couple who move from London to the west coast of Ireland and they discover at the bottom of their garden are some. Um, Little people, red caps, uh, goblins, leprechauns, that sort of thing. And um, it creates all sorts of havoc. And the, the what I've discovered is the phrase the little people doesn't really travel beyond these shores. It might mean something to people in America, but certainly beyond that, it doesn't mean much. Warner Brothers, uh, who are distributing the film in the UK, they felt... Also, it felt a bit small, ironically, the little people. They they felt it felt like a drama. And they're looking for something that says horror franchise, which is music to my ears, because that means ooh, sequel, and then three call and four call or whatever, you know. So this could this could keep me in uh, chocolate hobnobs for quite some time. So, you know, I, I was obviously very attached to the title. Uh, you know, we used it all through production. It's on the clapperboard and everything. It's um so it's what we've been referring to it for years, you know. And uh, so, you know, you find yourself not wanting to wrench away from that title. But then the Warner Brothers marketing department, they've sent me a cut of the trailer with the title and uh, posters, sort of test posters as well, where you see the title, the imagery and a shout line, which I can't reveal yet. Um, and you see them working together and you think, oh, actually, you know what? I really like that. I really like that. So, um, so yeah. And the other thing is, when the Warner Brothers marketing department says this is what we're excited about, you think, well, I'm going to let the Warner Brothers marketing department be as excited as they want. I'm, you know, let them let them do their thing. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. No, it's cool. Uh, so, um, all right. So we need a bit of a drum roll. I didn't have the cheesy well, uh, the cheesy iPad app. I'm afraid. I'm going to ask so our, our editor to, to do it on the table. I might ask our editor, JD, to add a little bit of reverb to my voice here, because I think the thing you have to do, because it's one word as well. It's gone from the little oh. people through to one word. So I, it does need a bit of a build-up. Okay, so okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, so JD, right. if, you, so, if you've got any kind of trailer music or whatever, if we can run that in the background <laughs> now, uh, and then I'll, I'll do my best trailer man voice. So. 
All right. So the the new title of Mr. Say's movie with Warner is... Coming in 2022, a film by visionary director John Wright, screenplay by vision-impaired writer Mark Stay. <laughs> Unwelcome. Unwelcome. I love Unwelcome. it. Yeah. So Unwelcome. It's just, yeah. It's is about... It, did it, it's, w- our original pitch was it's gremlins meet straw dogs. So it's home invasion yeah. with with little people, with leprechauns, with goblins, that sort of thing. So, yeah, and they are definitely not welcome. You do not want these little things in your house. I was going to say, it (laughs) absolutely has more of a, that title has more of a kind of sinister horror. Absolutely. Something's not, it uh, it leaves a lot of questions, doesn't it? I mean, you're like, okay, so what's on where the little people doesn't really, yeah, I like it. I think it's good. And also, Unwelcome Action. 2 has a certain ring about it, doesn't it? So, <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Oh, that's super exciting. So are there any, now it's apparently all on internet movie database now, the types yes. have changed. Yeah, yeah, are there yeah. any, is there any artwork that people can see on? Not yet, no. Yeah, nothing not, released? Not yet, no. I, I, like I say, I've seen a cut of the trailer, which is a crack. I know I'm biased, but it's a cracker. It's an absolute cracker. It really, oh, really, yeah, it's, it's really that's good exciting. fun. I'm in the trailer. Don't let that put you off. That might be cut. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, how does that happen? That's awesome. Is this? Is this? Were you? Um, this can you my, talk about that? Or this, well, yeah, I think your cameo. I think I've mentioned it before. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I we did a. There's a. There's a. There's a scene in a pub, and I'm in the pub. Uh, that's all I can reveal. Um, Excellent. And I, I hopefully Mark Hitchcock I don't stay. I don't ruin the film for everyone. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's. Um, Were you there in the back, like with your like crackly, like your rustly, like peanut bag or <laughs> yeah. prawn sc- pork yeah. scratchings? Yeah, there's. Will the, you the, be quiet in the back there? You might have written this movie, <laughs> but put those dry roasted away, please. It's the guy with the the boom mic going. I'm getting some noise here. I don't know what it is. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> They're saying my line from. Oh, we should do. <laughs> Sorry, didn't have any, didn't have any lunch. <laughs> oh well, listen, I'd love to go more into that. It'd be a lot of fun to kind of talk about your your time on the set once you can talk about it. We should also, as well, for the people listening to the podcast, we've been following this from like before it was even a movie. We were talking mm. about this with the very early days when you were writing it. We could, we'll have to kind of like put some kind of little. Um, little anthology together of all the different clips of you talking about on the film on, on the podcast but it'd be really nice if we can the day that the the movie poster or the trailer what comes first is it the poster or the trailer or both at the same time or is it is there no is there no kind of routine that's, for these that's things? a very very good question actually i would imagine see there, there is one image out there of our two lead actors so you've got douglas booth hannah john Kamen. there's one Im- image on imdb but that's it um you know what? I don't know. I imagine there might be a, a trailer first, but who yeah. knows? Well, when that happens, just just for our listeners, what we'll have to make sure is on the day it launches, we will put a email out to our mailing list so if people can see it. We'll tell them it's coming, it's going to happen, or it's happened on that day. So if you wanna if you wanna be the first to see the pic, the the actual poster of the movie or the trailer, and watch Mark eating peanuts at the back <laughs> of the pub. Then get along to the Bestseller Experiment website, click on the mailing list um, uh, tab and sign up to the mailing list because we send out, we also send out um, bi-weekly and sometimes weekly emails just to let you know which shows come out that, that week. So if you want to keep in touch with what we're doing, do that. But we'll we promise to put it on the mailing list to make sure that our Bestseller Experiment casters get to hear about it first which because i'm super excited this is just going to be it's going to be so exciting i just i love it <laughs> and it's and the thing is you know i i remember when we were writing back to reality we were very much always thinking about thinking it in terms of in terms of how it would play out as a movie and i know that you've done obviously screen screenplays before but um i think it's super important for people to remember writing a book think of it in your head like a film and i think i mean i don't know i'll ask you this question but it it surely must help the book have film potential if somebody reads it and thinks oh this would make a great movie yeah i mean you get authors like dan brown who basically write a screenplay 
in novel form. You know, I mean, that's right. um, he, he even, yeah. you know, in uh, Da Vinci Code, he even says, you know, uh, the protagonist looks a bit like Harrison Ford. Well, they got Tom Hanks in the end, so that's not a bad deal. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think I think so. It depends on the kind of film you want to make. If you're making that kind of um, genre blockbuster kind of movie, then then definitely you should make it very as filmic as you can do. Sometimes, you know, filmmakers love a challenge. Some of those unfilmable books have actually, you know, something like A Clockwork Orange, you know, absolute masterpiece, but um and take some big digressions from the book. Uh and it works really, really well. So I don't know. I mean it de- it depends. I mean, listen, go back to our episode with Eric Mikrans if you want to know about getting getting a movie made out of your book his story is just astonishing that was the episode before this so do check that out absolutely and um so yeah here's a challenge to people if you've been we've been talking a lot about dream declarations in the bestseller academy this last couple of months getting people to revisit their dream declarations that they made maybe at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of september when we had our first intake and i think it's really important that you think of a dream declaration not as something that you just you make it and then that's it it's actually an organic process which you kind of you you can change it 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 might it might shift it might move you might have a bigger goal you might want to pare the goal down if you think oh there's no way i'm going to do this so we've been really encouraging the academates in the bestseller academy to go back and review their dream dream declarations but if you haven't even done a dream declaration for 2021 i'm going to encourage you to to do it and send it to us um and i'm going to put a little twist on here if you've ever wanted if you've ever dreamed of a movie made out of a book that you write I want you to think about putting that into a dream declaration and not just like you want a movie for your book, but when the movie might come out, which studio might, might create it and who you'd like as your lead characters get really specific. Cause I think the more you paint the picture in your head, the more likely is that it will happen. It's just kind of how things work, I reckon in the universe. So yeah, <laughs> drop us an email, um, go to contact form on the bestseller experiment website, because we do look at every email as one lady discovered this week and she was quite surprised when she got a response from me i love those i love those oh i didn't think you respond <laughs> it's like well uh, we'll do we we'll do that at the end with social media got loads of great news and good news from listeners and academics and the bxp team at the end excellent stuff excellent stuff and you you mentioned as well something around the movie you're doing you're doing interviews this Friday? Yes, uh, we're doing um, uh, sort of what they call the EPK, the electronic press kit, which is where you're filmed, uh, and they ask you, uh, you know, where did you, where did, what inspired you to write the the uh, movie, and what was it like working with so and so, and blah blah blah. So you know, you've um, you get sent the questions in advance, thank goodness, and you can you know generate an answer, and it's the sort of stuff you see either on YouTube or on DVD extras, or uh, if anyone still buys DVDs, I. I still buy Blu-rays, um, you know, that sort of thing. And um, it helps sell the movie. I mean, obviously, you've got your stars up there. And then somewhere down here is the writer going, hello, I wrote this. With <laughs> <laughs> his back to the camera, very shy, <laughs> retiring type. I, I love it, though. I remember seeing the one you did for Robot Overlords. I think it was actually done at the studio, wasn't it? Because I think that it was... Pinewood with all the light stages in the background. I love those things because for me, if I love a movie, I just want to go deep on it. I I, I want to know everything about it. I want to listen to the commentaries of all the actors and the directors. I loved um, my my daughter's really into Lord of the Rings, and we've got like every single you know the the extended extended yeah, extended, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she's literally watched. I remember her sitting when she was about fourteen. She sat back to back and watched every single every single one and there was hours i mean we're talking i can't even begin to think i think there was like i'm guessing here like 25 hours worth of extra probably more right yeah and she um, watched all of it it's like a a degree in how to make a movie that is i mean that is how i learned a a lot about filmmaking because i was an early adopter of dvd and all of the all of them there it's quite unusual now but all of them had really good in-depth making ofs and i'd sat and listened to every commentary and so uh, so here's a question with netflix with netflix we've kind of lost that haven't we like there isn't or it all is are there make i mean there are making ofs like i saw there's a money heist making of like one hour special, but the extra kind of DVD types things, they don't really. Disney Plus are doing it. 
Disney Plus do it. Ah. So if you go on Disney Plus and look at Star Wars, it has, uh, it, I don't think it, it has, has commentaries, but it has making ofs and deleted scenes and little things like that. So it's not quite as um, thorough as a, a, a making of uh, might be, but um, it's they're, they're pretty good. The best one I've seen recently, actually, that uh, when they ended Game of Thrones, now whatever you think about the ending of Game of Thrones, um, there was a two-hour HBO special about the making of the series. Ooh. But what they did, what they did, rather than speak to the writers and directors and the actors, they spoke to the um, makeup people. They spoke up to the to, to the costume people. They spoke to the guy who made the snow. Because you know how much <laughs> snow winter snow is coming. Maker. What was his what was his credit? He what was, was he on the credits? Was well, he like snowman? Yeah, exa- exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it was great because these are the people who make these things happen, you know, the crafts people on the show. And they're mm. so important to any production. And getting his perspective on it. You know, having to generate more snow every week, more snow. He's like, more snow? Yes, more snow. And it's it's absolutely fascinating. I loved it, and uh, it's one of these things. I think you know, it's um, I think it's available online uh, wherever you get your HBO TV shows from. Oh, it's, it's I haven't seen that. I really want to watch it. That's interesting, actually, because I remember they talked about making snow in. Was it? Was it uh, Charles Dickens' a Scrooge um, Christmas Carol back in like the the very original version? And apparently the snow was all mashed potato. Potato flakes, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Potato well, flakes. They use a biodegradable thing now, which, um, you know, kind of melts away. And whenever they use smoke, I remember when we were shooting, we were doing pickups on Robot Overlords and they use loads of smoke. And the guy said, don't worry, it's perfectly safe, he said. But then that's what they said a few years ago when they discovered there was actually something a bit toxic in it. But don't worry, this one is perfectly safe. It's yeah, this one's, <laughs> this one's, <laughs> it's kind of bonkers, isn't it? Well, there you go, folks. There's a little bit of insight into what happens. But um, <laughs> I, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see. We'll have to do our own little kind of... Uh, podcast extras once the movie comes out and you can talk Absolutely. about all of the, the ins and outs of it um but to this week's interview we have yeah. we have a cracker oh my gosh yet again pulled it out of the bag mr stay um <laughs> tell us about our, our amazing guest this week andy hunter murray yes andrew hunter murray is a scriptwriter and a fact hunter for bbc two's QI. Now, shall we take a moment to explain to the rest of the world outside the UK what what QI is? Okay, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be good. It, it, and I should just mention it's my my mum and dad's favourite program. So oh, and it's it's one shout of mine out too. To my mum and dad. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> it was started by John Lloyd. Now, John Lloyd, uh, people will know. I mean, he's a TV radio producer. One of the first things he produced was something called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He also did comedies like Not the Nine O'clock News, Spitting Me, Spitting Image, Blackadder. You know, uh, but he started oh, QI. Wow which was uh, Stephen Fry was the original host. It's Sandy Toxvig now. And they will, it's, it's, it's QI stands for quite interesting. And they talk about things that are quite interesting and they'll have a letter of the alphabet and and they'll talk about, and it, it the, the point of the show is to sort of subvert your expectations. So they'll have, they'll have a question on the quiz and they'll say, um, who's next in line to inherit the throne of England? And you'll go, well, Prince Charles, obviously, and I go, eh. no, actually, it's some bloke called Colin in Guildford. You know, there'll be some obscure. <laughs> That's an erroneous example, but it gives you some idea. They will always, you know, you'll think they'll say, I remember the, how many satellites does Earth have? And you go, well, one, the moon. And it's actually, no, there are others out there. So it's one of these things that if you love nerdy trivia, it is just catnip, absolute catnip. And Andrew is one of the fact hunters for for QI. He it's also a great job. I what know, a great is, job, isn't it brilliant? He he also co-hosts a podcast called No Such Thing as a Fish, which is a kind of podcast spin-off of uh, of QI, in which the you know the 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 fact hunters all have wonderfully nerdy conversations. Now, this podcast, No Such Thing as a Fish, fish. Uh, as a BBC podcast, it's uh, I, I think it's had something like two hundred million downloads, which is almost as many as us. That's right, yeah, by yeah, a couple, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. <laughs> well done, well done, guys. Keep going. You you might catch Keep up going. with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andrew, Andrew, he's toured the world. He's toured the UK, Europe, and Australia with a podcast. He writes jokes and journalism for Private Eye. He hosts the Eyes podcast, Private Eyes podcast as well. But he's written a novel. 
And The Last Day is his first novel. And it's uh, it's it's a cracking read. It's It was one of the top 10 fiction debuts of 2020. And it's out now in paperback. And we talk about why funny people are expected to write funny books. We talk about world building and how that can get in the way of storytelling. We talk about deadlines and the essential element for any apocalyptic story. I was waiting for the big... Ta da! <laughs> no, that's it. Which that's is you get. a packet of hobnobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a tease. We're about, we're about to tease. Yes. You see, I've only been doing this four years, Mike. You have to give me a little bit more, a bit, a bit more time. Excellent. Well, listen. Let's find out what that is all about with this incredible interview with Andrew Hunter Murray speaking to Mark Stay. Andrew Hunter Murray, welcome to the Best Sell Experiment. How are you today, sir? Oh, fine. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, absolute pleasure. We're here to talk about your fantastic book, The Last Day, which um, is is kind of is kind of a pre-apocalypse. You hear about apocalyptic fiction, post-apocalypse, apocalypse. This is kind of this is humanity on the brink, isn't it? Tell tell us about the premise because it's absolutely brilliant. Well, the the idea is that the book is set a few decades from now in a world which has changed very drastically, and the main change that's happened is that due to a catastrophe in the heavens, the Earth's rotation has slowly over a period of years ground to a halt. So at the time the book begins. Uh, half the Earth is constantly facing inwards towards the sun, and half is constantly facing outwards towards the, the cold, dead universe. So, uh, obviously, things have changed, um, but the, but life survives, and like civilization kind of clings on in this narrow ring of the Earth that is, you know, in the kind of Goldilocks zone, where it's warm enough to grow crops, you're in constant sunlight, but it's not scorchingly hot, but it's also not freezing cold either. So yeah, you can keep a civilization going there just about with with all the things that we associate with civilization. But as you say, it's a civilization which is tottering, crumbling on the brink. And that's exactly what I was interested in writing. Um, not exactly the the kind of world where, like in the road, which is fabulous, everything has really, really fallen apart. It's it's an it's where people are still attempting to keep things going, and they're just about managing so far. And I think one one it, certainly in the prologue, there's a little glimmer of hope, you know. And I think, do you think hope is an essential ingredient? In apocalyptic fiction, because even in the road, uh, you know, which is really grim, uh, yeah. <laughs> even, even at the very end of the road, not, not no spoilers or anything, but there is a glimmer of hope. Hope is is kind of a, essential for this kind of fiction, isn't it? I really agree. Um, I, I the ending of the road is magnificent, and I think you have to provide some kind of sense of a torch being passed or the prospect of things continuing, improving even in some way. Um, and all so many of the great works in this kind of um, apocalypse adjacent vein, I think, managed to convey a sense that things will carry on somehow. What you know, values, civilization, that kind of thing can be passed on, and it can survive. Did you have to do a, a kind of a greatest hits reread of all the great apocalyptic novels, or was that just too grim to even contemplate? I well, I tried to stay away from from any that I thought would be too close. So I'm I'm. I absolutely love, for example, the novels of John Wyndham, and he writes brilliantly. But I, I kind of stayed away from rereading Day of the Triffids, for example, because I've, I've read it several times and I, I love it very dearly. But I didn't want to just be doing a, a knockoff mm. act, and I think that's important as well. So I kind of have been reading – I suppose I've been doing the Greatest Hits reread for a couple of decades now, right. and <laughs> I'm sort of steeped in it um, – yeah, background radiation. <laughs> now, you're established as a writer for Private Eye and QI. Very, you know, generally, uh, you know, very funny stuff, informative stuff, engaging stuff. When you went out there with your novel, were there people who expected you to write comedy? That Were they like, hey, you're the, you're the funny guy from QI. Why aren't you writing comedy? Yeah, I mean, I was one of those people who expected me to write something <laughs> funny. And... Um, and then I had the idea for for the last day, and I just couldn't not write it. I'd, I'd been writing mm. short, funny stories, um, kind of in the vein of Simon Rich, this kind of thing, who's a brilliant American humorist, you know, in that uh, American humorist tradition. And um, I, I was working my way towards something larger. And then the idea for this occurred to me. And that other side of my 
certainly my reading life, I think, came to the fore at that point because I've I've spent my whole life reading lots and lots of humorists, all the Adamses, the Pratchett's, the Woodhouses, but also the Wyndhams and and the Robert Harris's and the Cormac McCarthy's, and so that that side uh, definitely won out, and it was it was such a fun idea to play with that I I couldn't help but but follow that. One of the things that really strikes me about this is is the depth of research, and you go into things like astrophysics and climate migration, and obviously, you know, being one of the QI elves, uh, you, you, this is probably something you've touched on before. We're always fascinated about how people work with their research. Was was this research you did up front, or was it something you folded in as you went along? How did that work for you? It was m- mostly up front because when I I thought of you know a, a a world several decades from now where this has happened, you know. So at the point the story begins, it's it's thirty years since the Earth stopped spinning. It was really a research exercise for me. I just wanted to write that world and do all of the world building um, at the beginning. I wanted to know what would happen to, as you say, the climate and to geopolitics and to the the way people move around. What happens to the human sleep cycle if you're in constant sunlight, you know? And you you know people will excavate their cellars or they'll put up blackout curtains against the the sunlight. So. All of that was the first several months of writing, way before I had a plot or characters or anything like that. I just wanted to build the world um, as a a really fun sandpit exercise. And as part of that, I got to, um, I got very lucky because I I know an astrophysicist, um, my friend Josie Peterson, who's an astrophysicist at Oxford. Uh, I wrote to her and she consulted her colleagues. And then they sent back this amazing menu of options of how. Uh, you could stop the Earth spinning if you wanted to, because that and that happened quite late in the process. Actually, I really wrote, did a lot of the world building without ascertaining this could happen or how it would happen, what the most realistic mechanism is. Um, so th- it was very lucky that she wrote back saying, "Well, if you want to do it, here's how you could." <laughs> Brilliant. What I what I really loved as well is there are so many little tantalizing glimpses of of the world beyond the story. So there's one point where you talk about the east coast of America. It might just about be survivable, and you you paint this picture of you know New York in snow, and there's rumours of you know hunter gatherers scrabbling around there. That was that is that what came from the world building, or is that hinting at something for for further adventures in the same world? That was all the world building. I have a file, and only about I'd say a quarter of this huge long world file of uh, this word file of world building made it into the finished book, and there was lots of other stuff that could have gone in there as well but just at some point it becomes a um it becomes self-indulgent and i had a really good editor as well who definitely helped me avoid just you know incredibly lengthy exposition bits and said we want the story keep to the exciting story so well that, yeah. that's that's the thing we this is a conversation <laughs> we have a lot with our listeners you know they ask about world building and and when to stop you know when when do you stop the world building and start the story because there is there is uh there is a danger that you could just end up creating yeah. a giant game of risk you know yes <laughs> no story. absolutely in fact i keep a um a bad review of someone else's book uh in my email drafts folder as a thing to always bear in mind that you're trying to avoid i can't remember where it comes from which book it comes from and I, obviously I would never name it either but it's it's it is a science fiction book and it says it's it's got um stilted dialogue clumsy information dumps and a near absence of dramatic tension and I kind of keep that um review dangling over me like a sort of Damocles just to say <laughs> just review what you've got and see if it fits any of this description and if it does then you need to have another have another go Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you find? Did you create any kind of? Because you said it's all there in a word doc. So was it just a question of okay, you've got to this point in the story, you need to know something about the world. Do you just go search for it, or did you create some sort of data? Because again, the QI thing, I imagine you've got these great elaborate databases where you can just, <laughs> you know, is that how it works? Um, yeah, it kind of was. I had once I felt that I had, I was comfortable enough in the world that I would know roughly what was happening throughout it. I then started to build the story around it. And then at the, the the thing I found most enjoyable and challenging was the slow larding through of details about the world. Like when you give that detail about um, New York being, you know, shoulder deep in snow, and when you give the detail about they're now growing wine uh, in Cornwall because <laughs> the south of Europe is too hot to live. And, you know, so you, you can just stud this through, someone being offered a glass of, of Cornish or Devonian wine, and, and, and slowly you just... 
exactly give the reader a little glimpse um mm. you imply the presence of much more without having to um to set it all out in detail it's really that's challenging but it's also the most fun to me i really enjoyed that wonderful stuff this you as you say you've written short stories before obviously you, you've written f- uh, for uh, uh for uh, publications like uh, you know Private Eye. This is your first novel. What were the biggest learnings? I, I, I swore I'd never use that word. What were the biggest <laughs> lessons learned writing writing a novel for the first time? Um, well, it's 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 a strange experience because obviously at Private Eye there's a fortnightly deadline and you need to have something ready with the novel. There is a sense in which you can keep going for however long you like, and that's obviously a great opportunity, but it's also very dangerous. Um, and because it was the first one, there's obviously no deadline because no one thinks of you as a novelist. So no one is, um, no one is saying where's that novel. And so trying to develop that inner sense of where's that novel, um, was definitely a thing to learn. And the other thing I learned actually, once it had been accepted for publication was that you think you've finished it when you've sent it to a publisher and they've said, yes, we'd like to publish this and you haven't, um, (laughs) that's, the beginning of the second trimester, as it were, it's really, um, there are so many different rounds of changes. It, I mean, fingers crossed there are, you know, if your editorial publisher takes the draft you send them and says, great, let's let's get this out there, that sometimes can be an alarm bell. So yeah, patience with the next round of changes and knowing that's going to happen is, is a good thing. Uh, editors often tell us they love working with journalists because they're used a to deadlines and b taking <laughs> notes and making changes. Was was that a happy process for you then? Yeah, I had a, a brilliant editor called Selena Walker uh, at Cornerstone, and she is absolutely fabulous. And um, she suggested ways of tightening the plot, and pretty much every suggestion she made, um, I said yes. I slapped my forehead and said yes. Of course, why didn't I think of that? Which is a very nice position to be in. There were a few that we we wrangled a bit more over, but but as you say, as a journalist, when you're used to opening the magazine and seeing the thing you wrote a third shorter than when you sent it in, it's very good for building a slightly thicker skin and not yes. being too precious about having things changed. Absolutely, I did read somewhere. I think you almost gave up at one point. Is that oh true? yeah, and if so, what what kept you going? <laughs> Um, I yes, it is true. I did. I I got pretty close to stopping, or I had a, a little sabbatical from it because I was really I couldn't see my way through. I can't remember which point I was at. Annoyingly, I don't think I got to the end of a first draft yet. Um, oh, that was it. I got about thirty thousand words in, and you know that feels like progress. I mean, that's a third of a book there, and I got thirty thousand words in, and actually it was the it was too much world building. It was that I hadn't properly worked out the plot. I hadn't worked out the motor that's going to keep the reader turning the pages and you know ending every chapter with something exciting, some pull onwards. Um, I hadn't done that work, and I looked at what I got and I thought, mm, it's a world building book, and that it's not a story. And so I became pretty disheartened there. And I spoke to a couple of friends of mine who have already written books, and they said, yeah, you should probably go back and keep working on that, keep making progress with the thing you've spent six months on. And that was very good advice. Yeah. We've we've heard this before. I think one of the first authors who told us about this was the uh, award-winning children's author, Robin Stevens, and she called oh. it the suckage point. You get to about yeah. a third of the way into the novel, and it's usually about 30,000 words, Yeah, where you're making, it comes to the point where you're making important story decisions, you know, because openings, beginnings are are fun. You can have real fun with mm. them, but at some point you've got to start telling story and making decisions and consequences and characters have to pay for those consequences. And, and that trips a lot of people up. Yeah. it's And I think there is a slight embarrassment about admitting it as well. I'm very glad to be busting this taboo today, but there's such a, <laughs> there's such a sense of when you're writing a book you and you present it to the world you want it to look like you want it to look so finished and so flawless that it looks like the obelisk in um 2001 a space odyssey you know you think you want readers and anyone who looks at it to think i can't see the joins how did mm. how did he do this um that's the dream and so to admit that you got 30,000 words in and you were completely stuck it feels a bit embarrassing because it's the opposite <laughs> of what we are 
trying to present to the world, which is the finished thing. You know, well, I wonder well, one, about the Parthenon, the people who built it. If they if they had done an interview saying, I just couldn't, after I did one centaur, I didn't know what, <laughs> what was I doing? What what happens next after the first centaur? I don't know whether we think of it the same way. Yeah, yeah the, the, the plaster covers a lot of cracks, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> As, um, one of my favourite Billy Wilder quotes and paraphrasing is, is, you know, the better you are at hiding your plot points, the better you are as a writer. And it is, it is yeah. a, you know, this Frankenstein's monster of story, but when yeah. you present it, it's it's in a suit, it's hair's brushed, it looks smart, it's a tie, you know. So that's um yeah, that's exactly. what a lot of writers starting out need to need to discover. We're we're all we're also fascinated with writers' routines uh, and mm. daily routines. Uh, are you someone who writes on uh, obviously because you're writing for various publications? Are you someone who's writing every day? Uh, I try to yes. Um, Aspirationally, absolutely, yes. Um, <laughs> aspirationally, I write on my birthday and Christmas Day and, and every day of the year. Um, I I find that the best time for myself to write is in the mornings. I write um, before the day's work begins uh, on the day jobs um, mm-hmm. because I've got a little bit of time. And also the world hasn't come flooding in with its concerns and questions and um, problems and you don't have to think oh I haven't spoken to that guy about that thing I've mm. phoned up that person to do that and you know in the morning there is a, a little window of clarity and most mornings I do manage to briefly crawl through that window of clarity for however long um, it you know I think it has been a bit trickier in lockdown when you are facing the same environment all the time I've certainly found that but um, yeah that's that's the only way I've ever made any proper progress yeah Absolutely. The last day was listed as one of the top 10 fiction debuts of 2020. There's been heaps of praise, rightly so. We often find with debut novelists as well that, you know, once once they get the praise, they've got that difficult second book to write in a yeah. much smaller compressed period of time. Uh, is that, how are you getting on with that? Is How are you coping with that? Uh all right. I'm I don't I don't know what I can say about it annoyingly, but right, right. it is a strange thing because I come from the world of um comedy originally where the same thing happens at the Edinburgh Festival. A comedian will spend 5 or 6 years workshopping their first golden hour of a show. Mm. They do it and then their agent says to them, "Great, what are you doing in what are you doing at the fringe next year? You better come up <laughs> with your second golden hour." And so I've I've experienced the other side of that in that world. Um but yes, I have been working away at what comes next, and it's it, it, oddly having the you know the the good luck and the success of the first one is a is a big fillip. It really does um, focus the mind. I think <laughs> um, whether that's in a terrified way or a, a productive one, I, th- I think they can sometimes be the same thing. I think terror leads to productivity sometimes if you do it right. That I think we've just found the the title for this episode of the podcast. Terror leads to productivity. <laughs> Certainly works for me. Um, well, Andrews, thank you so much for speaking to us today. The, the last day uh, available now, folks, and it is an absolutely proper page turning, gripping read. And um, I know there's some people feel like they don't want to read apocalyptic fiction in the middle of a lockdown, you know, in, in a pandemic. But I, I. It's um. You read this, you think, well, things could be a lot worse. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's as I say, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is hope. There is there is hope in this book, and that's what's so essential. That's what really keeps you reading. So, uh, huge congratulations, uh, Andrew, and uh, I hope to speak to you again one day. Thanks so much, Mark. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author. Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy that's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy nothing like a pregnant pause there at the beginning of the interview just to build attention (laughs) i've got to say if i were if i'd spent a number of years being a fact hunter for a 
leading BBC show. I would say that's probably the absolute best training that you could have to be a novelist. And he just went deep into it, didn't it? And it almost, it almost to the point where it was like, whoa, okay, I've overdone it now. The the world building's like, I mean, you can get lost in that. And it sounds that's like what happened with Andrew. It's a fascinating, well, and, and, fascinating Andrew's insight book. that he caught it. Andrew's book, I've got a copy here. It's it's like um it's kind of like a Chris Nolan movie, you know? In that the uh, ah. in that it's really, really smart, but really, really entertaining. You know, and you're reading it and you're thinking, this is brilliant because I'm I'm just taking in all this great world building and facts and and interesting stuff. But there's a cracking story at the center of it as well. So yeah, there is a there is a balance to be had, and it's it's it is re- as Andrew said, you know, he, it is really, really hard. And it's. I find it fascinating that he did get stuck 30,000 words in. You know, Robin told us, Robin oh, Stevens told to us. I had smile when he, yeah, when he said that. I, thought, point. Oh, I was thinking, Robin Stevens. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. But I think also, that it is, it, but it's interesting as well. I think that is a very, very, very common thing for people who get into world building. I don't think it's possible to underworld build. Mm. <laughs> right i think overworld building is just what happens and you have to pair it back but it but a lot of people get lost and they get lost in their world and they and they never recover i know one 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 person who told me they they spent three years building this incredible world but there was no story mm. but it was like i mean it was this other universe with and he had every bit of detail you could ever imagine but he had no story written yeah, and that's that's basically Dungeons and Dragons. You know, that's gaming. That's where you know where you build a place where you can have fun. But uh, unless you've got characters making decisions and choices and and reaping the benefits or you know the consequences or whatever, then it's it's not a story. Um, what I with the Witches of Woodville books, I knew I had a village, and I knew I had a real world outside of that, and. There are certain flags, you know, I have to have a church, I have to have a pub, I have to have, okay, I need a butcher's and a baker's. And I had a few street names, but beyond that, I haven't really done much. So when I get to book two, I've got those, and then I can build on those. Then I can, oh, okay, we're going to have a country house on the edge of the village. We're going to have, oh, there's an air base over there. Okay, that's great. So it expands and I... It's it gets as big as it needs to be as you want to yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's a better way of doing it isn't it because really you grow with your world rather than becoming swamped by it and and and, and I, I think they well I mean it's a hard one because if you're if I remember Shannon Mayer saying to me actually off off interview once she's talking about the reason why she writes urban fantasy she said what she loves about urban fantasy is the world is already built because it's based on our world. But then she she adds a layer of magic over it. And that's the difference between having to start from a completely new, you know, ecosystem or a completely new universe or a completely new race from scratch, where there's I mean, that's that's kind of like starting the Bible all over again, isn't it? Or starting the Big Bang. It's like every single detail you have to and that it must slow writers down if they have to think of all those details up front. Yeah. And of course what Andrew's done with his book, he's taken the world that we know. And he's grabbed it by the ankles and given it a good shake and, and, shake, yeah. and turned it on its head. So we will have expectations about, okay, what happens when government breaks down? What happens with the food? What happens with energy? So all of those questions will, consciously or unconsciously, the reader wants answers for those. And it's up to you know, a storyteller like Andrew, not only to tell us an engaging story, but also to answer those questions. Because part of the fun of reading those books is going, oh, okay, they can only do this or they can only do that. Okay, that's great. So how does that affect our characters? And that's the important thing. I think, you know, you you could spend all day. We talked about that thing, you know, there's a bit set in New York, but obviously the book doesn't go there, but people talk about it. But of course, there could be a whole other novel that Andrew could write set in New York where things are very different. Um, so yeah, you can, you can tease, you can tantalize, but unless it's directly affecting your characters or your characters are driving these changes it's best left alone so i mean i remember we've had we've had great conversations with many fantasy authors in particular about world building and you know you always ask that question how does the plumbing work who who clears the toilets out that sort of thing but unless someone actually goes and does a number two you really don't need to know that 
No. no so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really interesting one. I've ne- I've never myself world built, so I'm only really speaking from other people's um, stories that they've told me. But it is a it is a whole storytelling process in itself in terms of actually just thinking of you know i mean it's a bit like it's a bit like historical fiction as well it's kind of almost the opposite of historical fiction with historical fiction you have to go back in time and find out all the thousands of details you need to find to kind of almost like understand the world that existed in the past Mm. and world building is is kind of moving forward or parallel or just off on another complete like tangent and and paradigm and 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 building it all from scratch so i I would say it's even harder more hard would you say it's harder than historical fiction in that regard because you're doing you're having to use your imagination from there are there are everything there are pros and cons because i'm you know crow folk uh and my books are historical fiction so there are things i need to get right Hmm. you know that i have to it's set in the war so i need to know about rationing i need to know about okay what were what were the arp doing what were the ats doing you know um, but then, and I've looked through books and I've highlighted bits that I think might be useful. But then I tell the story, and then on my second draft, I go, okay, what are the what's the bit of information that I really need to know? Uh, and then I I sort of fold that in. So I try not to let it get bogged too down in the detail. But there are I know there are authors who um, you know revel in this stuff. If you read someone like Ken Follett who wrote Pillars of the Earth, which is about the building of a fictional cathedral over 150 years or whatever. And obviously he's looked at how York Minster and Canterbury Cathedral were built and the sacrifices that people made and how it affects. So there's a lot of history going into that. And it's clear he's read every book on the subject or the Patrick O'Brien books uh, about, you know, uh, sailing at sea and fighting the French and stuff like that. Those books, you know, the people who read those know their history and you have to get that stuff right. You have to tell a compelling story with great characters, but you have to, you know, you can't suddenly have, uh, you know, a, a balloon coming along and saving the, you know, the crew, uh, and then whisking them away because they're being like, wait, that wasn't invented for another <laughs> sixty years or whatever, you know. So there's an extreme example, but it's um, there are there are pros and cons to each. Whereas with epic fantasy, I could have a ship at sea and think. Yeah, in this timeline, sod it. They've invented balloons. There we go. <laughs> Boom, done. Yeah. Uh, so you know, and, it, that's... and it floats upside down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's some right. of that's some of the appeal of doing th- anything like that. But I, the thing is, I think whatever you write, even if you write contemporary fiction, there is a degree of world building in it. It's your world, your rules. Uh, you know, there will be, and it, it will be new to readers. Funny enough, we're watching Breaking Bad again. Okay, because Claire never oh, watched really? it. Oh, really? Yeah, and we're watching <gasps> and. It's How's she so, finding it? Oh, we're loving it. So Absolutely good, it? loving it. It's my and, favorite ever show. And it's um, but it's bring it's introducing you to a world. You know, this New Mexico, and there are drug dealers here, and you. It's the, thing, it's the kind of thing. Well, I think well, I've read stories or whatever. I know how this works, but actually, you know, it does these wonderful little bits of subversion, and it's building a world in which you know this this guy can go from being a teacher to being you know. <laughs> <laughs> Heisenberg. And uh it's it's absolutely fascinating. So yeah. Actually, as a little aside, I'd completely forgotten. In the first few episodes, Skylar is writing short stories and she wants to write a novel. And I just hope oh. that uh in you know post Breaking Bad El Camino, she listens to a podcast interview with someone called Brian Cranston, who says, Take the bad <laughs> things in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and turn them into story. I, love I it. really, really hope there's a spin off there. But um, yeah, That's so brilliant. Yeah, yeah, degrees of world building. We're all, we're all building worlds. That's what we do. And and one other thing that really jumped out for me, and I've got I've got to thank thank Andrew for this. He talked about you asked a question about does he does he write every day and and mm. he said that he always tries to write before he starts his work day, which is yeah. an interesting way of putting it, but. I love the fact that he's doing it first thing because it's something I've been banging about, banging on about for ages. I really do believe that if you bank your words before you before you get cracking with the day, you know that if everything else goes pear shaped in your day, at least you got your two hundred words yeah. down. And then he, I love the way he put it. He said, "I like to write in the morning um, before the world's problems." 
come flooding in. And yeah. it's it's like that. You know that something I've stopped doing, Mark, which uh, which I recommend to absolutely everyone from a well-being, health, and productivity perspective is don't look at your phone first thing in the morning. Don't make that the first thing you do when you wake up. I've moved my phone out of my bedroom because it was it was my alarm and it was very conveniently mm-hmm. alarm, which happened to also then go ping. There's 15,000 <laughs> things that have happened whilst you're asleep. And I, I put it in the bathroom. So I now have to get up to turn off the alarm. But I've made a I've made a promise not to look at anything until I officially, in quotes, start my work day, which for me is like nine o'clock in the morning. And I've started writing again in the morning. It was mm. so bizarre. It was that's all it took for me to start writing again was to just not look at my phone because the minute you look at your phone, you see everything. And it's like it's like Andrew was saying, all the world's problems have flooded into your inbox, mm. and they're sitting there waiting. And the minute you look at them, you know they exist. If you don't look at them, they don't exist in your world until that point. So two things: write first thing in the morning if you if you're struggling to write, do it, bank it, but. In order to do it, don't look at your phone. And if that works for you, if you want to join my club, <laughs> then drop us an email, let me know. Because honestly, it's it's been quite life-changing for me. And it sounds ridiculous to say that, but that small thing, it made such a difference. Yeah, drop him an email. He won't read it till after breakfast, though. So, uh, but yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you no. might get a response around 9.01. <laughs> but yeah, he, he, he called it a, a little window of clarity. And that's that yeah. really resonates with me because I do the same thing. I, I do check my emails, but I'm able to sort of file it away and not worry about it till later. But I close yeah. that door there and sit down and no no distractions. I've started using an app uh, where what's it called? Let me bring it up. It's uh, it's an app called Forest, where it's like mm. one of these. Um, you 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 say right, I'm studying, and as you're studying, once you've you know. Uh, and, and if you turn it on and look at your phone, it says, don't look at me. You go, all right. And then you put it away. <laughs> and then you, you've you planted a tree once you've studied. And then you can oh, plant and trees and shrubs. You... And, you know, I've got a little yeah. forest now. It's great. So that's, um, that's, that's really helped me. But, yeah, it's um, that little window of clarity where you turn everything off. Because I, I, I do, you know, the phone is completely addictive. And you do end up just idly, you know, funneling oh, it into life. Well, and the, the trouble with the phone, I'm reading a really good book um, called Digital Minimalism. And um, it really, it talks about how electronic devices have t- literally taken over our life. And they say, phones are incredible. They're the most amazing things in our lives. But the problem with the phone is it's multifaceted. And the exact example I gave you of like, it's my alarm clock, which is why I have it by my bedside table. But it also happens to be my email, happens to be, you know, WhatsApp groups, and Facebook and all the other things. And it's like, and it's because it's multifaceted, that's its downfall. It's like, you can't just like, you, you, I mean, it'd be ridiculous to think in the old days, you like, you hit your alarm clock and then you turned it over to read something on the back of it, your latest novel like <laughs> but we do that with a phone so it's about how do we break how do we use it for what it's meant for and i think one of the biggest things about about banking those words is it's it's, it's around the principle actually a business principle which you read a lot in a lot of business books called pay yourself first it's this idea that a lot of a lot of people in business like pay themselves last after everything else has been covered and end up with nothing. But paying yourself first as a writer is actually something that we could we could call today, you know, bank your words first or, or write your words first. So it's paying yourself as an author is about is about getting those words down. It means that you are you are really focusing on on progressing your your career, your whatever it might be for you, a hobby or a hobby into a career. It's about you investing in yourself as a writer. So pay yourself first every morning with the words that you write. And that's when things happen. That's when things will change. So it's great to hear that that's, that's what worked for Andrew, especially when you think about his life. I mean, everyone says, oh, I've got time to write. And you think about all the things. Well, he's doing two major podcasts, mm-hmm. researching for a big t- uh, BBC TV show, no doubt has other things happening in his social life and families maybe and all these other things. And yet still managed to write a book. Hmm. it's like there's no one out there that really i think um ever has enough time to write a book and you'll never get enough time in the future don't wait to retirement because retirement's a myth you've got to do it now <laughs> so it's about banking though. so on that note on that note uh if you want something to get yourself in the habit of it 
do what Mark's done, do what thousands of people have done now. And that's join the 200 word challenge um, where you write 200 words a day. It's 200wordchallenge.com. It's free. You bank your words every day and it works, folks. It absolutely works. It really so does. Go give that a go today and sign up. It's addictive. Excellent it is stuff. addictive. Well, that's, it's a bit like, like running, you know, I sometimes wonder how can somebody go out and run 10K at the weekend? And they're like, oh, I love it. Mate, I feel so good. And I'm like, what's going on there? Mm. And I think the same thing is with a you know, book is a marathon. And you do, but you start getting little serotonin hits every day. You bank when you, and it's about banking. You've got to come to the website and put your words in. That's the moment you get a little serotonin hit where it goes, oh, I did it. I've got my words down today. And so um, it's a good addiction to have. There's made plenty of bad addictions out there. This is a brilliant addiction to get if you want to be a good, you know, a consistent writer and potentially prolific as well, because that's what we're seeing people becoming over the years prolific writers that are going to be putting out many, many books over their lifetime. So on that note of successes, Mark, um, lots mm. of things kicking around social media this week. Oh, so much good news. So much good news from our listeners. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, you know, if you are a member of the BXP team on Facebook uh, and if you support us on Patreon at the top tier, uh, you will be uh, mingling with the likes of the wonderful Cueve McDonald, who wrote Stranger Times. And um, just a couple of days after we re recorded our last uh, podcast, his book, Stranger Times, got a Kindle daily deal in the UK and it shot up the charts to number six and then got to number three. So at number one is some bloke called James Patterson. <sighs> Uh, at number two is oh, yeah. uh, Michael Connolly of this parish who we've interviewed previously. And there, next to Patterson and Connolly, is our friend Cueve McDonald with Stranger Times, which is one of my favourite books of the year so far. So huge, huge congrats to Cueve wow. on that. That is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Such good news. Uh, and and then, if you want to, re and then, I mean, we've done a couple. We've done a couple of interviews with Queeve on the show, haven't we? So go back, pop yeah. over to the website, and search for Queeve. His name is 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 an interesting spelling for non-Irish folk. Isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's uh, C A I M H uh, C A I M H McDonald, uh, so, which yeah. gives me hope because, like, I always thought with my name Devoe, it would just be like, what's the point of even trying to release a book under <laughs> that name? But if, if Queeve can do it. Yeah, yeah then anyone can. That's I'll pop a link in. I'll pop a link in the show notes to his previous interviews because he's always good fun, always always good value. Um, we've had a couple of our uh, BXP team publish books. Uh, now we've had a book from uh, Craig Anderson. Uh, Craig Anderson has uh, a fab uh, uh, book called Grow Up, which to me it reminds me a lot of Terry Pratchett's Only You Can Save Mankind because it's about kids and it's about computer games and getting involved in the computer games. So it's absolutely awesome. Grow Up. Now you might remember. But Craig was the first listener to send us a finished book, a book that had been inspired by the podcast that mentioned the podcast in the acknowledgements, which was the Lucky Beggar trilogy. So, Craig, this is just wonderful. You know, Craig is one, you know, first listener to reach out to us with, with his finished book. And also, you know, still writing, still going strong, writing in a slightly different genre now as well, which is absolutely fascinating. So, Grow Up is out there, folks, if you want to find that. Uh, I think that's Amazon. Uh, and also, an author called Christopher Stay. Uh, who is who is a relation? He's my cousin, Chris. He's a relation. Um, I was going to ask. He's, he, he's published a book called Far from the Tree. And now, when I worked in London, Chris and I used to regularly meet up and talk about writing and exchanging ideas and what have you. And I know Chris has been working on this for a while. Um, and it's the first book in a series. So go check out Far from the Tree by Christopher Stay. Uh, the Stays are now taking over the literary world. We're everywhere now. You can't avoid us. Uh, bow before us. <laughs> It'd be the kings versus the stays. It'd be a whole new Game of Thrones thing going on. Exactly. I've seen, I've seen Christopher's, uh, I've seen Christopher's cover. Absolutely love it. Really, really good cover. He's done a cool, done a very cool. Look so trailer. go check that out. He kept sending me the trailer as well, saying, "What do you think? What do you think?" And uh, when everyone, anyone sends me a book trailer, I, I quote: "There's a guy called Alexander McKendrick who directed a whole bunch of Ealing uh, comedies and films." Uh, in sort of the 50s and 60s and then went to teach at UCLA and I said I'll tell you what he told his film students about their short films uh, short films come in three lengths which is too long far too long and far too far too long <laughs> so it's like <laughs> so his trailer was like one minute and 30 I said try and get it down to 30 seconds and he got it down to 30 seconds and it really wallop wow. wallop 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 and it's it yeah. really 
yeah. works really well. That said, Fantastic. you know, you look at my YouTube page and all about 10 minutes long, so I can't talk. Yeah. Uh, well, it's <laughs> absolutely cobbler's shoes, isn't it, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of YouTube, uh, Angela Nurse, who is also in the BXP team, she started her own YouTube channel. Uh, and wow. she's talking about, so this month sees the publication of her first book, Jack in a Box, which is a uh, first in a crime mystery series. So she's on, on YouTube as Angela C, the initial C, nurse. And she's doing, because you often hear from listeners, listeners often say to us, okay, look, I haven't published my book yet. What do I talk about? What do, why would people be interested? But Angela has it completely sus. She's talking about her journey. She's talking about her characters. She's being relatable. So if you're a writer and you're starting out, check out Angela C. Nurse on YouTube. And also she has interesting earrings in each episode. One of them, she's got little chairs and one she recorded yesterday, which is May the 4th, Star Wars Day, May the 4th be with you, with you. She has little lightsaber earrings. So if you're a fan of earrings... Uh, check out Angela Sinas on YouTube. Absolutely. And I just want to say congratulations to Angela because I know she's had quite the journey getting mm. to publication. And I love, I love, love, love to hear about when a book is finished, when you write the end. But I also love to hear about when a book actually is being released because it makes such a massive difference to know that someone who's like, you know, there's everyone goes through ups and downs through through their journey but it's so lovely to hear of people getting to that finish line and then getting that book out there so congratulations angela and everyone else who's you know struggling with books you know be inspired by that there's always the finish line in sight if you keep writing every day and last but by no means least well how do you feel about books by listeners getting published and then becoming number one bestsellers how do you feel about that i feel <laughs> fairly uh, Fairly excited about that, Mr. Stay. Tell me more. <laughs> well, this this was this was the email you uh, uh, alluded to earlier in the show, where you said uh, we replied, and they went, "Oh wow, I didn't think you'd actually reply." But this was such a wonderful email. This is from Deborah S. Rowe, and she says, "Hi, Mark and Mark. I'm a faithful listener to your podcast. I truly enjoy it so much. You make me laugh, which is such a good thing these days. I love how positive you both are because you seem so welcoming of news from your listeners. I wanted to share that I just became a self-published author on Amazon this weekend, and my book has already become a number one bestseller. <laughs> and she says, funny that selling four copies in the category Nepal guides can do that, lol. Anyways, I plan to continue the journey and right after I sign off here, I will join your 200 word challenge. And the book, the book is looks absolutely brilliant. It's called Always Pass Uphill of a Yak and other lessons from Nepal. And it's actually, it's also number one in uh, Hindu history. Uh, so do check it out. Wow. It's, it's described as, you know, a bit like Bill Bryson. And I love Bill Bryson, you know, his travel writing. It's funny and it's travel. And it's Nepal. Again, harking back to last week's episode with it Eric seems, Mikrans. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we, we've got to do a live show from Nepal with the Dalai Lama or something like that. I we, think we, we should will. look into that immediately. Um, There's obviously a reason why Nepal <laughs> keeps showing up on this podcast every yeah. single every single. Calm Episode Karma, now, man. Right? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so Excellent. huge, huge congratulations to Deborah on, on not only publishing, but getting a number one bestseller in an obscure category, which is something we know all about. So. <laughs> Absolutely. That's brilliant. Well, congratulations. And thank you to everyone else who has dropped us notes, telling them how this podcast has inspired them to write, to keep writing or to start writing or to dust off that hard disk or that manuscript they found in their loft from 20 years ago and thought you know what i'm going to give bash this into shape and see if i can get it out of there if that's you thank you so much and please do keep your stories coming we love to hear about your breakthroughs your successes your dream declarations and everything else that inspires you to keep moving forward folks and uh, mr stay congratulations on another milestone with your movie with a change of name and i uh, can't wait to hear more on that and um and we've got cracking we've got some cracking interviews coming up haven't we over the next couple of months my goodness me there's one coming very very soon which is gonna is gonna divide people and it was some of the most fun i've ever had with an interview uh it's um yeah it's it's not the next one i think it's the one after it's an absolute hoot uh is that the most fun you can have in an interview with your clothes on <laughs> well i hope so yes <laughs> <laughs> well, i can't wait yeah to hear it's that a good one. one it is a good one excellent stuff so it's a we just want to say welcome to all new listeners as well if it's the experience of the bestseller experiment do do go back and have a have a flick through um 
the first season just to kind of get get your chops in and understand what this is all about the crazy journey we've been on um and until next time mr stay have a great couple of weeks and it's a goodbye from mark one and a goodbye from mark two goodbye goodbye goodbye